Dr. John Schumann, who has been president at Oklahoma University Tulsa since 2015. He also holds the Gusman Endowed Chair in Internal Medicine at the Oklahoma University Tulsa School of Community Medicine. Dr. Schumann completed his McLean Fellowship in 2002-2003 and then stayed on the faculty for many years. His scholarly work includes research and advocacy on the ethics of profit-driven commercial screening tests and on social determinants of health, as well as analyses of patients that leave hospitals against medical advice. AMA, yeah. Dr. Schumann has authored the weekly blog Glass Hospital since 2010, which is aimed at demystifying medicine for lay audiences. And today, he's going to discuss with us an ethical and education look at social determinants of health. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. It's, um, like a lot of people have said, it's great to be back in Chicago, and I love coming to this conference, and uh, it's so nice to um, visit with Mark and Anna Siegler and um, Lainey Ross, who's been a mentor to me for a long time, and of course, an incredible opportunity to uh, hear from Paul Farmer yesterday, so um, it's nice to be back. Yes, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, social determinants of health, which is something that I spend a lot of time thinking about. And as someone who moved to the frontier of Oklahoma, um, really with my wife, who's also who's a family physician, to um, build a four-year medical school in Tulsa, the satellite campus of our uh, main health science center, which is in Oklahoma City, um, I, I now am in the privileged position of being the campus president. So I think about a lot more than just, I always say just medical care, just medical school, but think about um, these other things down at the bottom of this slide. So uh, as was mentioned, I, I write a, it's not so weekly anymore, but a blog that's uh, self-funded and non-commercial. And then I'm a frequent contributor to both local Tulsa Public Radio and then a little bit to NPR as well. Um, and then this, this campus that we have in Tulsa is a mostly graduate campus. So in addition to our medical school, which has a PA program, we have colleges of allied health, public health, and nursing, but perhaps most importantly, our biggest program, our biggest single program is social work. And then also our second biggest program is nursing. Um, so I think about social determinants of health from a sort of, I guess you could say, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary way. And um, when we think about the social determinants of health, we think about the conditions under which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. And I actually find this Dahlgren and Whitehead uh, cartoon the most effective. There's multiple representations of social determinants of health, um, but I like this one because it's like a rainbow, and who doesn't like rainbows? Um, and it's actually called the Dahlgren and Whitehead rainbow. But if you look in the green, the green uh, arc, you can see, I always talk about this to residency applicants and to medical students, but healthcare services, that thing with which we spend, uh, if you look on this pie chart, healthcare, so it's estimated between 10 and 20% of our overall health is determined by healthcare, and yet collectively as a nation we spend $3 trillion on that entity, and, and yet we, we don't really focus on those other aspects. And so the, really the ethical question, and I think it's been addressed, um, uh, especially Marshall Chin's panel yesterday, um, where it talked about advocacy. I've long had this, this ethical question of how do we get medical professionals, or if we want to talk about it, clinicians thinking about social determinants of health. What is our ethical obligation? And from maybe a Laney Ross perspective, are we, do we give it the office? Is just being a healthcare professional enough and seeing patients, or in fact, is it incumbent upon us as professionals to kind of move beyond the healthcare realm and into the broader context of health? So this is from the World Health Organization's um, Commission on Social Determinants of Health. And uh, it's kind of a busy schematic, but you can see on the left um, what are called the structural determinants uh, of health inequities, and on, I guess, your right, the intermediary determinants, the intermediary determinants of health. And you'll note that the health system is only one small box in those intermediary determinants that have the impact on equity, health, and well-being. And it's really this larger structural element that. Paul Farmer, as he you know, said, borrowed from liberation theology. But so what is our obligation as healthcare professionals? And you'll note, too, there's a small bridge between the structural and um, intermediary determinants, which is that social cohesion and capital. And I would, of course, submit to you that right now it's stretched rather thinly, at least here in the US. So this is some of the suggestions from the World Health Organization report. And I'm not going to bore you with the text-rich thing, but a couple of these. One is on social stratification and mentions specifically child welfare measures, including the implementation of early childhood development programs. 
And, um, you know, uh, James Heckman, who is uh, on the University of Chicago faculty, has written about this extensively and, and won a Nobel Prize for his work showing that every dollar invested in early child education saves approximately $7 or provides a $7 return on investment down the road, whether it's through saved health care costs or incarceration. Um, additionally, I think Evan Lyon referred to this yesterday with the uh, expansion of Medicaid, for example, in Oklahoma, um, that unequal policies have been somewhat remediated where additional care and support for disadvantaged patients or chronic catastrophic illness and injuries. So I think it was Evan who talked about people with bullet wounds walking around with helmets and skull wounds that couldn't be fixed, but now with the adoption of Medicaid actually are getting health care. So, um, that's really my question is what is, what is the role of the clinician in all this? And um, I thought I would give you sort of a baby, something to smile about, uh, babies and rainbows. So um, it's um, this article, um, which is something I, I, have, uh, I would recommend to you. This is from Academic Medicine. It's written by three Canadian physicians at Toronto. And um, it's a critique, really, of social determinants of health um, as a curricular element in medical education. And it's not a critique of the fact that social determinants of health are now being taught much more widely across the medical education continuum. But the critique comes from more of a viewpoint of, is awareness enough and are we reinforcing inequities in healthcare by only teaching about social determinants of health and not really activating our, our uh, future medical professionals to actually work in the structural change realm. And I thought this was a pretty provocative article and kind of interesting. But I, I choose to take the sort of Gretchen Schwarzy approach which is that culture change has to come from changing the language and the narrative. And if we aren't going to at least teach about social determinants of health, it seems very unlikely that we're ever going to make the kind of structural change that's necessary, but it's important. So now let's focus on the great state of Oklahoma, our 46th state, and where I now come from. Uh, I like to joke and call myself an Okie, of course, in Oklahoma. I've never truly accepted as a real Oklahoman, although I did get this incredible job that uh, I sometimes still feel like an imposter in. But um, this is from the Commonwealth Fund's annual state health care rankings, and you can see that number 50 right smack in the middle. Um, well, the good news is that uh, this, this ranking includes 51 states because it includes the District of Columbia. So Oklahoma comes in 50, but we always say in Oklahoma, thank goodness for Mississippi, and no knock against Mississippi, but in fact, Mississippi ranked 51st. But depending on who you look at, this is from the United Health Foundation's uh, rankings in 2016. Um, overall, in, in determinants, and these are not just social determinants, but these are behavioral determinants and policy determinants, which arguably are the same thing, we get a 46 ranking. And just because we're the 46th state does not actually mean we have to be 46 in overall health outcomes. But you can see, and so I'm going to focus just on a couple of the social determinants um, that I want to share with you. So Paul Farmer talked about um, trauma deserts. He talked about care deserts or clinical deserts. So food deserts is probably something you're all much more familiar with. And I, I don't really specifically recall, so I apologize if I'm getting it wrong, but I'm assuming I lived here for almost a decade and would think of places like Englewood or some of the, some of the poorer south side neighborhoods as food deserts, but I don't know if that's been remedied. But this map of Tulsa, you can see these yellow areas to North Tulsa and west of the Arkansas River and West Tulsa are food deserts. So that what that is defined to mean is that there's not an actual full service grocery store um, within two miles of any of those neighborhoods. So that's actually a pretty wide swath of our city um, and suggests some striking differences. So one in four Oklahoman children um, go to bed hungry, not every night, but are uh, counted as food insecure. Um, another of our big social problems is that Oklahoma, again, leads the nation in female incarceration, in fact, leads the world. We have more women per capita imprisoned in Oklahoma um, than almost anywhere else in the world. Um, and the question is why, and it has to do with um, draconian laws for drug possession that provide stiff um, penalties and sentences for people caught either in the uh, purchase or um, uh, trafficking of drugs. And fortunately, and this was an, uh, an op-ed from Nicholas Kristof in the New York Times, who's taking kind of an interest in Tulsa, and there's a little bit of a ferment that's going on specifically in Tulsa, not so much, sadly, the rest of Oklahoma, where we are trying to address some of these social determinants through a combination of public and private um, work together, so some foundations working with some, some of the more enlightened policies. So I'm going to show you a, a couple of examples. So this is hard to read, but at the top, you can see that just since fiscal year 08 to uh, 2015 that Oklahoma has cut more of its uh, public spending for education, and this is, this is state appropriation than any other state by a lot. 
Um, you can see that North Dakota has a, a, a more than commensurate rise, and people attribute this to oil wealth in North Dakota, so that there was the uh, Bakken shale play where uh, a lot of mineral tax goes in to fund public uh, education as well as other uh, um, uh, enterprises from the state government. Well, Oklahoma's had a difficult, when the price of oil fell in 2014, um, we had three successive years, and this is the kind of stuff I deal with now on a regular basis, is the state uh, appropriations to education. Uh, and this has had devastating effects. Uh, on our uh, public education, both common education and higher ed. So new, nearly two-thirds of Oklahoma st students uh, are receiving free or reduced price meals. And so um, that's really a reflection of the level of poverty in, uh, in, in Oklahoma. Um, and then this is, refers to one of the structural equities. This is actually a tweet from one of the teachers. We've had a massive brain drain of, t of public school teachers leaving the state uh, because um, of a state funding formula that penalizes local jurisdictions for actually raising property tax to enhance. So for example, in Tulsa, if we were to pass a levy that would raise property tax, and we're a low property tax state, so if we were to raise it in our own county um, and earmark those funds to raise teacher salaries to prevent this brain drain, we'd be penalized by the state formula, and an equal amount of our funding would be then taken away from us in the state appropriation formula. So that's one of the things we're working on um, to try to change at a legislative level without much luck. So um, there were over a thousand public school teaching vacancies, and so the state needed to provide emergency certifications for to fill those classrooms. In many cases, those classrooms are going unfilled, so you have classrooms like my own children go to public school where there, there are often more than 30 kids uh, in the classroom, which is highly suboptimal. So I'll shift to some of the good news. So um, this was another Kristoff piece about Oklahoma. And m many people don't know this, but um, Oklahoma's um, one of the states that was earliest to ad adopt universal uh, pre-kindergarten. And again, this was an effort um, based on the part of someone who had read a lot of Jim Heckman's uh, research. And so a billionaire um, who decided that he was going to have his foundation really lobby. And so the state actually matched um, funding and, uh, with his seed money. And so we actually have universal pre-K in Oklahoma. And in the, in the county where I live, Tulsa, there's universal pre-K available for um, people below a certain income level. Um, and so at least we're trying to change the inputs to the problem. Um, and if you start early, it's likely that we can break the cycle of intergenerational poverty. But when you figure that kids are getting early child education, they're getting to public schools that are underfunded, um, it doesn't seem good. And so this is sort of how I address it myself is, um, you know, I, I work in the public schools. And now that I'm not a full-time clinician, in fact, I'm a very part-time clinician, I go in, into um, a nearby public school and read uh, every week with, um, actually this is my, uh, the people that I worked with last year, um, but I work with a different kid this year. But we, we work on reading fluency with this program called Reading Partners that's staffed by AmeriCorps volunteers. And um, you know, this is always that wrestling between the individual clinician making an impact one-to-one um, -one versus working on a po population level trying to make affect more policy change or work to address it. But what's great about the position of being a campus president is when you do this, you can role model it, and then your institution can become a, a vested partner of the, of the nonprofit organization. And so we wound up being a, a named partner of this organization. So the question is, are we going to be able to shift these paradigms in uh, social determinants, hunger, education, employment, um, neighborhood effects, or, or housing? Uh, I didn't talk to you about the employment situation or housing, given that I had limited time. But um, I wanted to use this article as sort of a jumping off point to really ask this question and really kind of derived out of, out of Marshall's panel and, and say, I love the fact that at a McLean Ethics Conference we have a whole panel, in fact we had a whole award given to somebody who spent his career in the health and human rights arena looking at global health and social determinants and structural violence and we had some, you know, University of Chicago faculty, because you're, you're, you were un unanimously University of Chicago faculty on, that, on Marshall's panel, talking about physician advocacy, again picking an issue and showing that good research makes good advocacy, but asking fundamentally, how do we translate that energy and that advocacy into our, into our future generations and generation, generations of learners? Um, and so with that, I say thank you. Are there any questions for Dr. Schumann? And Marshall. Yeah, Marshall Chin, and thanks for the great talk, John. 
Uh, so Bill Meadows had opened the, the day with uh, uh, the slide that had that very powerful slide about language and how you just change one word and it's a whole different meaning. And at one point when you showed the article uh, of like uh, the Canadian authors, you mentioned the importance of changing the language, changing the story, and then you didn't really sort of explore further. And, and you were a master at this in terms of like your ability to communicate both with an audience that's a very academic as well as uh, the lay uh, audience in Oklahoma City. So can you tell us a little bit more about what do you mean in terms of like how would you use language, how would you use stories then to, to change that, that narrative and to advance in terms of further addressing social determinants? Yeah, so uh, thanks for the question. Um, I don't have a good answer for you, but I, I think that um, you know I have made it sort of an academic interest to, to communicate with the public and sort of, um, I guess, leave aside the medical ease and the medical jargon. And um, one of the things I strive for in the blog is to always remember what it's like to be a patient, because even though many of us in the room are clinicians, doctors, nurses, what have you, we are all patients too, and, and, all, and we'll, become, we'll become that um, if we're not already. So just trying to kind of hold on to that perspective. And when I talk about social determinants of health to learners, whether they're medical students or residents, I find it strikes a very, very strong chord. I mean, they're very interested and engaged. And I didn't go on to talk about, but the four-year school that we um, developed in Tulsa is about, uh, is named the School of Community Medicine. And the idea was that it would be a unique curriculum with a design focused on social determinants of health. But interestingly, the operationalization of that was kind of left out. So we, we raised funds, we started the school, we have to be LCME, LCME accredited, and then our residence program is ACGME accredited. So the question really becomes with organized medical education, how do you shift that paradigm? I mean, because we can talk about social determinants and advocacy, I think all we want, and feel virtuous about ourselves, but until the, really, the funders and the regulators and the accreditors are able to somehow grant us, whether it's grant us or we seize the upper hand in order to um, you know, push for that kind of change, I think we're stuck feeling like virtuous people fighting an uphill battle. Thank you, Dr. Thanks. Sherman.